this get into the installation uh, where it's, you know, carefully reviewing, uh, review of the installation manuals prior to installing the equipment. Uh, it'll help you familiarize with the need to know the details as unit clearances and function codes can vary greatly between equipment type. It's important that you refer to the ship with installation manuals, come with the indoor, come with the outdoor units that you're working on, right? Uh, take getting help. Uh, if you're working alone, although, you know, some of the systems are lightweight for their size, it's important to have, uh, always to have the proper help, not perfect help, proper safety lifting procedures. Okay, so um, when you're, you're moving equipment, you should know, you know, what the weight is, and where the handle is, you have proper tools and hand carts and uh, uh, whatever you're, you're using to, um, to help you get the equipment across uh, you know, someone's backyard, on the side of their home, on a building, on a rooftop, whatever it may be. Now, getting into those installation manuals before setting that outdoor unit, the most important thing you can do as an installer is to make sure that the minimum clearances are met in every direction of that J series. An important attention, it's important uh, um, to pay attention to detail during uh, the outdoor installations, right? So is uh, making sure is the minimum clearance from the top of the unit to any uh, wired uh, top clearance, right? Uh, upon, you know, any side clearances. Um, so it's all, it's, this is why it's so important to refer to the installation manuals for all of the proper clearances, top, bottom, side, uh, um, back, so that we're installing a proper Installing it, you want to make sure that you have room for servicing. You want to get it up off the ground. You may have it on a stand. You may have it on risers. You may have it on a wall bracket. You want to make sure that you get it up and paying attention to the detail of airflow and servicing, right? You want to make sure that there's space around the unit's proper amount of air front to back, back to back, front to front, right? So that we're not interfering with any airflow that may be going to the system, right? Do not just install this right to the ground. The system has to be up off the ground. You have to make sure that you have an ample amount of space off the ground. This is an e-pump. They do go into defrost. You wanna make sure that when it does go into defrost, that, that water that's, that's defrosting off the coils, things drain. Drain pan um, has to come in and out and not freeze, right? especially in cold times. Make sure the units are elevated much higher to keep them above any anticipated snow levels, right? If it snows in your area. If it doesn't, uh, you still have to get them up off the ground, regardless, right? They have to be installed properly. Uh, making sure that when installing the outdoor unit in, in those low, uh, uh, Temperatures, low, low uh, outdoor ambient. Some type of windbreak or wind baffle to protect the outdoor units from from the wind and drifting snow, or any high wind that could, you know, uh, windmill the propeller on the outdoor units, especially the side propellers. Right. So, uh, and 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 obviously this will keep it. This will this will help with keeping defrost cycles short uh, and, and, and increasing system uh, life expectancy as well as efficiency, right? When there's a, when there's a wall to rare uh, uh, installation and the side, the side walls are extended uh, past the units recommended to install, uh, you know, like a, a dark You want to make sure that you're sizing it properly. You're not causing any, any um, uh, restriction of air. And the air is blowing out from there, so it's not going to cause any restriction. But you want to make sure that you're installing it properly, where you're not causing, where you're going to be in the flow of the air. And one of, one of the many uh, uh, key features of an installation is that you're going to be uh, 
units, especially the indoor units, right? The the um, the the identical indoor unit models are used across all air stage outdoor systems, outdoor unit series. So it's important that you know as the installer, make certain you refer to the installation manual, uh, the specifics of the unit that you're working on. Um, most of all, the clearances, the clearances of the system, right? Clearances are. And you're going to see, you're going to see this little notification pop up on slides. Uh, it's very important because there is an addressing of the system, and that involves setting rotary switches uh, and dip switches. So, um, what we what we're, what we're trying to let you know is this notification here is telling you. Because you're using multiple indoor units, whether it's one outdoor unit with multiple indoor units, or if you have um, multiple outdoor units with however amount, the recommended amount of indoor units, there is an addressing that needs to be done and that requires setting rotary switches and dip switches. And, and the thing we want you to know Right, the importance of this is is manually setting these switches on the system before you mount that indoor unit in place, so you don't have to get back on the ladder, have to go back up there, disassemble the unit, get into the control board, uh, and and get to the the rotary switches and the dip switches. Do it while it's on the ground, while you still have it on the ground, and it's easier to work on. Just a tidbit of information, and we want you to do that with all of the Fujitsu equipment before you put it in place, the units will have to be, the units will have to be um, addressed. And you wanna make sure that you're doing it properly and you're doing it while the systems are on the ground. Now, the, the comp compact cassette unit here, we give you a little uh, heads up about the installation limited space in the drop ceiling, uh, then you're, you're going to be adding field installed thread and rod, nuts and bolts, making sure that your drainage, there's only one port for drainage on your cassette units, whether it's a compact cassette or large cassette, there's one drain port. And that drain port uh, it, it incorporates a condensate pump that's already built into the indoor unit. So your compact cassette units, your large cassette units, your medium static ducted units, your slim duct unit, they all have built-in condensate pumps, but they also have all but the cassettes, all but the cassettes have the option of gravity feed. The cassette does not have the gravity feed option. It only has the pump option, right? But you need to read the installation manual. No, the amount of lift for that condensate pump, how much you can go up with it, right? And it's not much, it's, it's 27 to 33 inches of lift, inches, not feet, inches, inches of lift, right? So those are the details. Don't, and we start adding, uh, you know, we start running uh, pipe, and you think that you may have 26 feet of lift or 33 feet of lift, you read it incorrectly because it's, it's the maximum 33 inches of lift from the drain port, right? And then we show you different installation methods where you're using. Uh, a certain amount, you know, you could be using two to three to four cassette units in the ceiling and how you can actually pipe the drain together. As long as it's got gravity pitch or where you want it to, to go out. Now we have the air handler, 
multi-position air handler, also part of the J series. The RUX model, this series here, it does require condensate craft. Always make sure you're looking in the installation manual for that. So you, you have to install the indoor unit. Um, make sure that you have the appearances and you're installing it. Supply air coming out the top, return air on the bottom. You always have to make sure that you're you're being you are also field installing uh, a filter rack for the unit, or you could be installing filter grills somewhere in the home or building. Okay, so not only do we have to do a manual J calculation, but now you have to do a D manual D calculation for the ductwork. That's that's imperative, that's mandatory. There's no way around it. Load calculations are mandatory, or you're not doing it correctly if there's no load calculations. Now, installing the system in a location which can you know withstand uh, a load of at least five times the weight of the main unit, right? Which uh, which is highly recommended as well. So just remember to follow the installation instructions, right? Especially on the uh, the ABU units, whether it's a ceiling suspended unit or a universal unit where you can install it down vertically on the ground, close to the ground, and or high up on the ceiling, right? So the different models that we have. So there are adapters that come with the indoor units. They are flare connected. You're still going to need to flare connect. But there is a lot of brazing involved with this unit. A lot of brazing involved. We'll get into that a little bit later. Right. So um, these are. Slim duct unit, the ARUL, slim duct, slim compact ducted unit. You can install that slim compact vertically and horizontally. Unlike the ARUL compact duct model, you, you may not install that vertically. It can only be installed horizontally. So you need to know that. You need to know what model you're working on, so you're not installing it incorrectly, right? Now, again, the ducty unit, slim duct, you know, I'm sorry, medium static duct unit cannot be installed uh, in a vertical position. That would be this, this model here. Again, minimum clearances, we give you the clearances of the indoor units, how to install them from in place, horizontal installation, what it looks like you know, from the side, where which ductwork may be totally sensitive when you are uh, servicing and access, access to the to the electronic, to the flare connection, to your drain ports. Right for maintenance, servicing, and cleaning. You have to make sure that you're mind what you're doing. Hold on, hold on a minute.
slim dunk unit again can be installed vertically can be installed horizontally you got to read the manuals because there will be instructions for the vertical installation that you're seeing right here the vertical installation that you're seeing right here right will require you to go into the electrical compartment find a controller board per service manual per install manual you're going to look for dip switches. Hold on one second. So dip switches are going to be on the control board in this area here, hold on. This area here, the control board here, right in this area here, and you're gonna follow the instructions. It's, it's gonna tell you um, which set of dip switches you're going to need to disable in order to disable the condensate pump that comes with the system. Once you disable it, then you have to use the gravity pump that's right here. The gravity pump is what's gonna take your condensation out, not the pump. The pump will have to be disabled. There's a float switch in that pump. You're installing it vertically, the float switch opens. And once the float switch opens, you'll get an error code. Float switch error code, condensate pump error code, which is why we need to disable disable the signal that's coming from that pump which will allow the unit the system to shut down and we don't want that when you're installing it vertically if you're using the gravity drain um you can take you know it's not it doesn't have to be drastic just be out of level or or three eighths of a, of a tilt right three three eighths of a tilt even maybe even less just enough to get out of the bubble right so that you have the unit um, draining towards the gravity drain port right would make you see a unit installed in, a, in an attic, horizontalized, and ductwork installed. To it. Now here you can see the L brackets that come with the unit. The L brackets that are on they they, they come with uh, bolts, nuts and bolts. And threaded rod is field supplied. Threaded rod is field supplied. Now, the ARUL, the ducted units, the slim duct unit, the medium static ducted unit, they have a factory installed compensate pump, right? And it does not necessarily have to be used. You, you don't have to use it. Um, you, you won't be able to use it in the vertical position. But if you were installing this, if you were installing it horizontally, you don't have to use the pump either. You could use gravity feed if you, you know, if you're if that's available, right? So what you're seeing here is if you're installing this horizontally, that's what you're looking at right here. There's a cap, there's a rubber cap on the gravity feed. This right here is where the gravity drain line is. This is your condensate pump drain adapter. Yeah. So if you are using the gravity, take this cap and put it on the pump. Put it on the pump drain because it's active. It's still live, right? The pump is still alive, but it's just not drawing. It's not 
going to lift the water out. Not when the drain is open, there's not enough water to accumulate to allow the pump to work. But you still may get you know, some, some dripping of water. That's why we want to put the cap on so water doesn't drip out of that drain, right? So here is the switching of the drainage function going into the indoor control board mechanism, going inside the indoor control board, and it tells you dip switch set four, right? Dip switch four, switch one. Dip switch set four. And that was, that's the conversion you have to do, right? News for the system, here's where you see the drain for the pump, right? The factory installed condensate pump. This will provide up to 26 to 27 inches of lift. Just make sure you're aware of that. Make sure you're aware that that's the lift that will be provided by the pump. Don't go any higher than that because the water will come back down and overwhelm the drain pan and possibly overflow. So we want to make sure that we're within the limitations, right? Every air stage indoor unit, uh, every air stage indoor unit is shipped with an accessory bag. Right, so one of the most important items is the drain hose adapter to match the metric condensate drain stub to three-quarter PVC. So that drain adapter comes with your ducted units. It comes with your cassette units. It doesn't come with your wall-mounted units. The wall-mounted units already have their own insulated drain line. It's about 18 inches long, maybe 20. Right, so this drain adapter, this drain hose is referencing the slim duct unit, the large, the medium static ducted unit, the compact cassette, large cassette. And when installing that drain hose, as you can see how you're gonna slide it on to the equipment, indoor unit. Make sure you're, you're installing the drain line properly. The top picture is how you should be installing the top and bottom. This comes right out of the installation. The, the a, ARUH models have two drains main drain, overflow drain. See that this one here does require a trap, the trap pipe um, through the metal. At least six inches. Now, you will note that the, the H2 measurement is two inches. So the minimum trap height is six inches overall between H1 and H2. This requires uh, with at least a uh, six inch trap overall. If the trap is not properly installed, you're on the negative side, right? So the condensation, condensation may be held up and not draining properly. Right, so when you have a secondary drain on here, you can even do this little bypass. Bypass. That that blue part is coming from the drain pan. Okay. 
So refrigerant pipe, right? You want to make sure we're using the proper pipe, ACR type, right? 410A recommended. Um, sometimes the use of existing line sets cannot be used because they may be the wrong size line set. One of those line sets that's that's not compatible. So you'd have to find a way on how to get the new line set, you know, making it incognito, right? Aluminum tubing is definitely not uh, permitted. Aluminum aluminum tubing is definitely not permitted, right? So. If you're not sure what pipe size to use, contact the distributor you purchased the equipment from, right? It's their, it's their responsibility. Let me let me repeat that. It's their responsibility to support you with the materials required for that Fujitsu installation, right? They need to be involved. Always. Now, one of the most important documents to be provided to an installer, uh, to an installer is a design simulator piping report. The piping report provides detail of the refrigerant line sizes and the piping arrangement between indoor units. So in the absence of that design simulator, which your distributor should have, you can manually determine the correct refrigerant pipe as well. You'll just be reading some manuals. You'll, you'll be referencing three, to be exact, three different uh, refrigerant pipe tables from manuals, right, A, B, and C, which are found in the outdoor unit installation manual and the design and technical manual. And that's a strain. That's a strain, you know, that um, if you're not reading, it's it's going to be um, detrimental for you to understand if you're going to be doing it manually. But we also do have a design simulator that will help and make it much quicker, right? Instead of, you know, straining or draining yourself and doing manually, unless you're really good, you know, with calculations, right? I know there's a lot of smart people in here and, uh, you know, could be uh, engineers as well, mechanical engineers who know how to use a, a calculator. Now, we talked about separation tubes before, right? So a separation tube uh, can be used anytime there is more than one indoor unit installed. function uh, of a separation tube is to divide refrigerant flow, similar to like a, a conventional forged teeth fitting. Now, the separation tube minimizes pressure drop and maximizes equal oil distribution and return, unlike the forged teeth fitting that you made. It does not um, provide that. What a separation tube does. Separation tube is properly engineered to split the proper amount of refrigerant going through that um, separation tube. It looks like a Y, right? They look like it looks like a Y, right? They're they're specifically specifically engineered. And anytime you're using multiple indoor units, the separation tubes or what you're gonna use so that you can pipe to the next indoor unit. We'll get into headers as well, the separation tubes here. And if you look real close at these separation tubes, they're designed for, uh, they're designed as increase, or decreaser at, at the joints when you, when you, you're using separation tubes, but then you cut the pieces to match the line set required. Right? So here are the part numbers. Here's the part numbers for your separation tubes and your branch headers. Right? The set the, the design the, the design simulator will for a select the correct separation tube or head. Right? And you can do whatever you want as long as you know what you're doing. <clears throat> but we want to make sure that we're installing the correct separation and break. And that we're not making it wrong. Right? So if 
looking at this right now, you'll notice where you would cut if you were going to swedge copper. So the separation tubes have brazed connections and brazed connections only. And, and a wide range of pipe sizes in and of those separation tubes. So to make sure we're getting proper return, consistent, it's even better, consistent oil return from the compressor. It's critical that the separation tube be installed plus or minus 15 degrees from a horizontal plane as you can see here. Oops, hold on a second. There we go. Now, to avoid any possible refrigerant noise and to make sure that we have stable refrigerant flow, we need to always provide this amount of refrigerant pipe in between your separation tubes or, or uh, separation tube, separation tube, or even installing separation tube to the branch kits. 20 to 24 inches between the inlet and outlet of the separation tube assembly, as well as the header. Now, here's just an example of separation tubes installed and how we have them sitting flat. They sit flat, not on edge. So if you were to put your hand on a table right now or desk, wherever you're sitting, Palm down, flat, it's flat. Palm down on the table. Spread your fingers, that's flat. Not on edge where your hand is now on the side, right? It's hitting the side of your palm and your pinky. It's standing up on edge. That's not how you install these, ever. It has to be flat, like your hand laying flat on a flat surface. That's horizontal. Right? So we want to make sure that we understand that. We want to make sure that the part numbers that go along with it, right? Installations which have uh, multiple indoor units and grouped together, um, they can be used using uh, an optional header uh, instead of multiple separation tubes, right? You got to know that there, there are two headers. One is for the gas, one is for the liquid. Separation tubes as well. Separation tubes, one is for liquid, one is for, for, for gas, one is for, for discharge, one is for uh, return, right? Same with the headers that we have here. When you order this equipment, you got to make sure you're ordering it correctly. And don't, you know, uh, don't hesitate. This is level. Making sure that the L shape, the L, the L shape of this header is pointing downward. You can always put a little pitch on here, not much, but you you you, you get the, the gist. These L shapes, these these L shape bends should not be run upward, right? So we just want to make sure we're installing those. At the end of the header assembly, a minimum of three branch connections must be made, right? We must connect a set of pipes farthest from header tube connection. Right, so refrigerant piping. The design simulator can be used unless you want to keep track of all of the copper that you're using. And specifically, if you're doing it by hand, you're writing it down, you have to measure out what you're doing. You, know, you have to unroll the line set and measure out what you need. And make sure that you always cut off just a little bit extra so you're not short on just say you need to bend your copper lines to the outdoor unit, you're not short because that bend is now taking your minimum away. Now the 
A4S refrigerant piping. This is an example of the and length limitations, which are which are less than other J series models. The smaller series, yeah, right, the S series units, they do not have a subcooled uh, heat exchanger. So therefore, the refrigerant pipes cannot be run as far as the other. Right, we have to maintain this. Right, so I always want to make sure. Please note that uh, although similar pipe lengths are different depending on the model, they will be different depending on the model. So your job is to make sure that we're reading it properly. J4 refrigerant piping. J4. Refrigerant piping, the height difference between the indoor unit and outdoor units. Outdoor unit higher than the indoor unit, 164 feet maximum. The outdoor unit lower than the indoor unit, 131 feet maximum. The height difference between indoor units has to be 49 feet. Folks, when you're when you're 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 installing these units, you need to know the amount of lines that you're going to be using because there will be minimums that you must adhere to. If not, and you run a longer line set than what you just what you've seen here on this page, depending on the model. But we can't guarantee it's going to work properly. We can't guarantee that it's going to cool. We can't guarantee it's going to heat. We just know that from our recommendations that what was done at factory, when you run it at with 16 foot minimum, eight foot minimum, nine foot minimum, uh you're well beneath the Okay, now, J4, right? A lot of line set here. Generous line sets, right? So, and, and you know, far in excess of traditional systems. So here, here's just some examples, right? So you gotta make sure that you carefully follow the installation manuals, right? There's there, these installation uh, images right here, right? There's two examples in this image, the 131 foot pipe length from the first separation tube to the farthest indoor unit, right, is the shorter in the blue arrow. Maximum distance between the first separation tube where it branches off to one or more indoor units to the farthest indoor unit away from the outdoor unit. And so the actual piping width is 300 and, uh, 393 feet and is measured one way. It's a line set, you measure it one way, flare connection to flare connection, uh, installed liquid pipe. Farthest from the outdoor unit, flare not connections to the farthest indoor unit flare connections. And yeah, for example, uh, if we had an indoor unit installed and piped at its maximum 393 feet away from the outdoor unit and had installed a maximum 131 feet foot of piping between the first separation tube and the farthest indoor unit, this would leave a maximum of 262 feet of pipe available for the remaining run to the outdoor unit and system branches. So let's take a look at the refrigerant piping here for the J3L and the examples that we have here as well, right? Notice the total amount of line length. It's, it's, it's 1,300 and, 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 and,
if you're flaring, you're using the proper flaring tools. And when you're tightening your flares, you're using a torque wrench. That's almost mandatory in my book because the torque settings will be found in your installation manual, right? So torque, torque range settings, very right, they're very vital when you're tightening your flare connections. Refrigerant, piping, uh, brazing, right? All, all of the J series, all J series is, is refrigerant pipe connections. Uh, right, and uses flare type fittings. Now, the example you're looking at here, right, um, we're, we're using uh, uh, five eighths flare at the vapor line uh, connection to the service valve, and the the uh, the line, however, has to be increased to three quarter OD at a distance not greater than three feet or three linear feet from the service valve. The reducer is field supplied and may be uh, raised or flare type fitting based upon your preference. But please remember to provide nitrogen purge while brazing and to properly torque your flare nuts when using a flare connection or union. Right, we want to make sure of that. There are four different ways of running your line set out of the. There's a light up here. If you're knocking any knockouts out, please make sure you're filling it with putty. When you're brazing, make sure we're using all broad, proper brazing techniques. Right, all of the J series outdoor units and compatible indoor unit features, uh, uh, flare connections. Brazing will be minimal and exclusive to the refrigerant pipe connections at separation from the journey copper fittings. It's extremely important that your best practices are followed when brazing, right? And by means of a continuous flow or purge of nitrogen ranging uh, between half, half pound to, to three PSIG uh, of, of refrigerant, uh, excuse me, of nitrogen flowing through the system while brazing. Right? Want to make sure that we're brazing correctly because as you can see on the bottom, when you're not purging nitrogen, that's what's happening on the inside of the pipe. Same thing that's happening on the outside of the pipe. But if you're looking at the type, the, the top picture, the top photo shows you what raising of nitrogen does to the inside of the copper when you're purging nitrogen through the system. Nitrogen is a must. You must have nitrogen. Right? We just talked about anywhere from, you know, 0.5 to 3 PSIG of nitrogen into the vapor, uh, into the line set while while uh, uh, grazing. We want to make sure that nitrogen pressure tank is 600 pounds of a holding charge for, for 24 hours. That's that's true. It's right out of the installation manual. I don't make this stuff up. Right. So the uh, the, the the prescribed Nitrogen pressure test is 600 PSIG for 24 hours. That's 600 pounds of a holding charge in your system for 24 hours. And you must read that in the manual, right? So that 600 PSIG will let us know if there's a leak in the system. You saw how many feet of refrigerant pipe we can be using Right, so you want to make sure that nitrogen is flowing, but also holding charge. Right. Once everything is done, you've braised, you've purged, you get rid of the nitrogen and vacuum pumping. Vacuum pump. Right. So. Uh, 
uh, when the pressure test has been successful and nitrogen uh, released from the system, vacuum pump, clean pump oil, and proceed with your industry vacuum procedures. Very simple. Industry practice, right? 600 pounds of holding charge, 24 hours, no leaks. And then make sure your vacuum pump will hold a level of five, uh, anywhere from three to 500 microns. Now you can go down as low as 300 microns, but not to go above 500. Right, just industry practice. All right, folks, let's move right along with electrical and wiring, right? Again, we have the, I think we have the best manuals in the market for all the documents that we have. So if you're installing the system and you need the electrical requirements, please make sure you're looking for the, in our manual if you're doing it yourself or electrician uh, is used, please make sure you always refer to the latest installation manuals. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the submittals or design and technical manuals when, you know, especially when, you know, factoring any labor and materials required for any given project. You may, you may also refer to the line voltage and communication uh, wiring reports from any design simulator when available, right? Highly recommended. Now, although, although there, there are several methods in which the indoor units can be wired, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Gate series single phase outdoor units typically um, require a two pole 40 amp circuit breaker. Now, there is a, a, a MCA minimum circuit impasse rating, which is used to determine the wire gauge between the circuit breaker panel and outdoor unit. Typically, typically this will be uh, somewhere in the eight gauge copper wire, right? So always refer to local codes, electrical requirements, licensed electrician when performing any of these calculations here as well, right? So the, the required power on the J2, uh, J24S, J24, uh, 208-230 single phase plus or minus 10%, right? And make sure it's always properly granted, always properly granted. You know, the, the J3L, 208-233 phase, right? Very important. For smaller properties, you can reduce the breaker size. You know, for the J4, uh, J4S products, and just always take note that if you set the breaker size down, the capacity will decrease accordingly. So be careful when designing the system to make sure you'll have enough capacity for the space. It's design simulator, perfect tool to use for that, right? So now the J series outdoor units may have a smaller breaker than the J2. Certain J4, uh, systems may have the breaker size reduced even more. Using the breaker size, uh, and there's a function setting. There's definitely a function setting on those outdoor boards. You can see it right there, seven segment display. And with the power on, power has to be on for this to work, right? You'll, you'll notice the mode exit, the select and enter buttons. Follow the instructions on how get function codes out. There'll be certain function codes required using, uh, you know, for breaker sizing. All of the J3L outdoor units, OA230, three phase, require correctly sized dedicated three pole circuit breaker. And the minimum circuit impacity rating is used to determine the wire gauge between the circuit breaker panel and the outdoor unit. So it's from your main electrical panel, your main electrical panel to your outdoor disconnect. The indoor units 
indoor units, we will see the exact same voltage, right? Those requirements, same exact as the outdoor units, way two thirds single phase, right? So we want to make sure that we're installing properly and using the methods, you know, to wire the indoor units. It's a little bit different. The indoor units are wired separately. The indoor units are wired separately. They have their own power source. The outdoor unit has its own power source. So you're incorporating power for the indoor units, power for the outdoor units. They don't share the same power. Right? So when that line voltage connection at the indoor units are to provide some type of loop at the end of the conductors. Like as you see here, this is considered what I call a fish hook. That's considered a fish hook that's underneath, under your um, thermal screws, right? Right here. Little fish hook, remove the screw. Put your wire here, put your screw through the fish hook, and then screw it down so you've got a nice flat surface. Right? Now, also here, it's a key point to, to note is that the indoor units are powered independently. We already said that from the outdoor units. It's, it's not recommended or permitted to power the indoor units from the outdoor unit at all whatsoever. So make sure that you note that it is possible to combine multiple indoor units on one breaker, on one circuit breaker. Indoor units connected to one breaker must be in the same refrigerant circuit though, right? So as long as the combined ampacity of the indoor units does not exceed the minimum circuit ampacity of the wiring across the air stage product line, all indoor units have a maximum circuit breaker rating of 15 amps. So here you see another example. The number of indoor units that can be connected to a 15 amp breaker. The design simulator will also do this for you. It'll let you know how many indoor units you can connect in either series or parallel wiring. over the breaker impasse. Okay, so you don't go over that breaker impasse. Now, the lower voltage wiring, this is considered communication. Communication wire consists, it consists of single twisted Now, folks, we've talked about this all the time. No wire nuts. No wire, no wire nuts. No wire nuts are, are ever recommended. None. So we want to make sure that we maximize, you know, a, a connection signal quality. And in order to do that, to maximize the communication signal quality, it's recommended to avoid splicing your communication wires with wire nuts. Please use crimp type connectors such as uh, butt connectors, closed connectors, uh, closed end connectors, coupling connectors, right? So those are a no-no. This, these right here, definitely. Absolutely, because you're not twisting the wires underneath. They don't have no twisting capabilities and don't twist the wire. Just put them together, put the cap over, crimp. Here, it's a coupling. It's basically a coupling. Strip both ends of the wire, strip the both ends of the wire, insert the wire into here, crimp. Insert this wire into here, crimp, done. And then tape it if you'd like to tape it, make it, you know, 
state so it stays together. Right? Make sure we're, we're taking care of the ground too. Now all communication wires, all these communication wires must be grounded. At it. Do not over tighten screw terminals. It will cut into your connections and damage and possibly strip those little terminal block screws. What do you, why do you feel the need to put a drill on these screws and tight and tight? And tight, make sure that the, the wire doesn't come out. Here you have um, the, the example of communication uh, terminal block for any of the J series. You'll see the X1, X2 terminals for communication with the indoor units. The Z1, Z2 connections are used when multiple outdoor units are linked to a complete communication network. All right? So here you can see an example of transmission line. The transmission line um, board for the A or a, a J2 unit, right? So note that Z1, Z2 connections are used when multiple outdoor units are linked to complete a communication network and can be controlled with a central controller. Now, when there's more than one network segment tied, into a controller, you would connect your condenser or outdoor unit, your outdoor unit via Z1, Z2 terminals. Communication wires have a maximum length. The wires, the wires length is 1,312 feet from outdoor the first indoor unit from your outdoor unit, your first indoor unit, maximum of 1,640 feet within one <clears throat> network segment. That's a lot of wiring. The communication wiring, communication wiring, it shows a simple X1, X2 connection between the outdoor unit and all of the indoor units. The terminal connections are not polarity sensitive. The terminal connections are not polarity sensitive, but must be grounded. What you're looking at here, <coughs> excuse me, X1, X2 and signal ground terminal connection at each indoor unit terminal, right? Each indoor, indoor, uh, indoor unit terminal block. The foil shield. The foil shield within that cable is in contact with the bare ground conductor. So when, when properly uh, uh, installed at each ground terminal, it provides excellent resistance uh, to electrical interference and high pitch signals, anything that may be transmitting through the wire, high pitch frequency, any type of noise, and so forth. Here we have the series in parallel. Series, also known as daisy chain, Parallel also known as home run, right? Two different methods, two different methods within each uh, wiring method, you know, within each of the wiring uh, possibilities. So there's there are two, and they they may be used in the field, right? Most common, your daisy chain, right? It's a, 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 which is a series connection arrangement between all the indoor units, the outdoor units. The, the, the uh, 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 parallel, right, refers to a home run method in, in which each indoor unit is wired in parallel with respect to the outdoor unit. Now, to make sure that we are properly communicating, right, we have this pink wire. <coughs>
So that pink wire is your communication wire. We call it the Fujitsu pink wire. It's actually made by Honeywell. Honeywell number 3254, right? Now, X1, X2 terminals are connected between the outdoor unit and indoor units. X1, X1 and X2 terminals are between the outdoor unit and indoor units. The Z1, Z2 terminals of the outdoor unit are only connected when another air stage Z series, a V series, J series, or a V series system is wired in a communication network. Communication ground wires, shielded ground, must be connected to the ground at each unit. Then there's unit addressing which will dictate which wiring method is used, right? So getting into the system startup, <clears throat> air stage indoor unit and outdoor units are shipped with default dip and rotary switch settings, which may or may not need to be changed. Right, that's important to know. So the system setup, indoor unit addressing, outdoor unit addressing, indoor unit dip switches, Outdoor unit dip switches. Terminal resistor. Terminal resistor is a booster for your communication wire in the event that you go over a certain. Your J series indoor and outdoor units communicate with each other through a digital communication bus. In order for the units to talk to each other, to one another, dip and rotary switch settings are checked and set by the installer at each piece of equipment for correct unit identification within that communication link. Now, first and only recommended method to address indoor and outdoor equipment is known as the manual address setting, where just as the name implies, right, manual. That includes rotary and dip switch settings are checked and set manually by the installer. The automatic addressing method, although uh, it's, it's less involved by the installer. However, the indoor unit addresses are assigned in the order in which they are registered upon power, which is why we always recommend doing it. So you have the system set up. You have indoor units typically have, the indoor units typically have a five rotary switch with four of the five used to set the indoor unit and refrigerant circuit address. The outdoor unit will have a refrigerant address only. The outdoor unit will have a refrigerant address only, as there can only be one outdoor unit in each J-series refrigerant system set. Now, each rotary switch represents numerical value and that's indicated by the arrow which determines the address number by multiplying arrow setting by the tens or by the ones and the installation manual will provide a table which allows the installer to determine how to set the rotary switch set based upon the desired address all the indoor units, which are piped together, must be set within the same refrigerant address. <clears throat> so 
So there's only there are only two rotary switches. There there are only two rotary switches at the indoor, excuse me, at the outdoor unit, right? So if uh, if that J series uh, is a standalone where there's only one refrigerant circuit involved, you can leave the refrigerant addressing rotary switch to their default position, which is zero, zero. Each indoor unit within a refrigerant system must have a unique indoor unit address. Has to, the outdoor unit can be left at zero, zero. The indoor units have to be addressed in. So real quick, think about it as living on a street. You, you live on the block. The outdoor unit, refrigerant addressing, Right, is the street. The outdoor unit is the street, the street name, right? It's Fujitsu Boulevard. And each indoor unit has its own address, has its own number. That's setting it up manually, right? Because you got all these houses on that one street. They all have to be set manually as a house number, right? If that makes sense. And again, due to the numerous uh, indoor unit model types, the layout of the rotary switches and the printed circuit boards will vary. They're going to be different, right? So watch the rotation of the board. Always recommend to set the dials before placing the unit in the location you're going to be installing Setting the rotary switches before an indoor unit is set into place will help prevent a setting error. By the way, when changing rotary switch positions, the power must be off. You're doing this with power off. Rotary dip switches are only read upon power. If you make the changes while the unit is powered, the setting change will not be recognized. Right? So, you always want to make sure. You always want to make sure the J series system also use what is known as the dip or dual inline package switches, right? Dip switch setting changes are required at the indoor unit, but not often changed for indoor unit setup. Only rotary switches are used for address settings. Right, hold on one Dip switches are arranged in a group of four, right? And they're designated by their set number followed by the individual uh, switch location number. So for example, in the, in the example you're seeing here is set three, set three, dip switch one and two are in the all position, while three and four are on. Similar to rotary switch changes, Dip switch setting changes must be done with the power off. 
Otherwise, the new setting will not be recognized. Right? There are there are uh, a total of five dip switch setting sets in uh, in the J series units. Right? So so just be um, just take note. Right? Only set five. Muted. system is the ability to connect a variety of these indoor unit styles. Now, each with its own remote, temperature, schedule, fan settings, right? Air stage indoor units are not shipped with controllers. They are not shipped with controllers. I gotta make the rules they do. So, so allowing the system designer to mix and match a wide variety of control options to meet the customer's needs. Please make sure you know that um, um, the difference in the UTY, RHRY, and the uh, uh, RSRY, the RHRY has no ability to change operation mode. This remote is better to be managed by either a Z5 controller, a central type controller, um, as well as the you now the 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 UTY RSRY is more of a regular control with the ability to change modes and so forth, right? So. We are larger installations than when the J series systems are, are applied and being used with the V series three phase uh, equipment. We offer uh, a variety of controls for multiple uh, system to individual unit control. Right? The next individual remote control option is known as a two wire, it's a two wire remote. 
and then move them down. Right. So unlike three wire remotes, two wire remote controls are not shipped with the interconnecting cable and must be field supplied uh, using 18 gauge thermostat wire or that pink wire. You can use the pink wire as well, the communication wire. Okay, so note here that the Y1 and Y2 from the indoor unit uh, to touch panel remote sub base. The Y3 terminal is not used. It's a two wire. You don't need to see. Okay, so just to show you a little bit uh, from the indoor unit, the touch panel remote connections and sub base are shown. Y1, Y2, and polarity sensitive. System evacuation. Now, because the indoor units are powered separately, we don't want to apply power to the indoor units before you've done any nitrogen check. Being service valves any of that if you apply power to the indoor units the EEB coils are located in the indoor units all of the electronic expansion valves metering device will be located at the indoor units you're closing those valves completely you'll be closing the valves completely and nitrogen may not make it to the indoor unit. So we needed to get that out there. Make sure that you're all paying attention to this, right? Nitrogen purge, system evacuation. So as discussed with the power, not to apply the power uh, to the indoor units, nitrogen purging when brazing uh, or evacuation uh, will not be successful if you powered up the indoor units, right? So you want to make sure uh, that we're not causing ultimately uh, a costly system contamination, right? We're not causing any problems with that. Now, there is a function setting if you were to accidentally turn power to the indoor units, it's happened and it will continue to happen. You'll need to go to the outdoor unit, power it up, follow, follow the mode exit button, the select button, the enter button. And, and following those directions, you would enter F as in Frank or F as in Fujitsu, the number three, dash 21, right? When the uh, when the step down is complete, a uh, you'll see it, it'll say P O F F, which means power off, which will be shown at the outdoor unit seven second display. Once that is, once that's happened, then that means that you've opened up the EV coils. Nitrogen six hundred pounds of a holding charge. 600 pounds of a holding charge, purging nitrogen through the system while freezing. Um, anything else I missed? No. Vacuum pump, make sure the oil is clean. Make sure the oil is clean. Make sure the hoses on your gauges are all in good shape. Make sure that the gasket has been replaced for all your gauges. So there are no leaks. There are no leaks at your gauge, your hoses, in the hose that goes to the vacuum pump. Everything has to be checked. Just don't take it for granted that it's fine. Check it. When's the last time you guys have checked your, your equipment to see if it was in good condition? Right? The only method of charging is to weigh in the added refrigerant. So there are calculations that need to be done. There's no topping off, there's no superheat, there's no pressure as you go by, especially on a Fujitsu system. As far as the refrigerant charge goes, the J-Series outdoor unit 
the J series outdoor units. They don't have a pre-charge of refrigerant. So the minute you start adding line set, you got to keep track of the liquid line set, the liquid line set. And you need to take the measurements of each line set that goes to each indoor unit so that you can add the refrigerant correctly. Because the minute you go over what's the, what the factory charge is, and that's just the refrigerant in the outdoor unit. If that's a problem, now we're leaked. We've leaked out. And we want to make sure we're putting in properly. So you need, these, you need to do these calculations. So let me go back to this one here. Once the installed liquid line lengths are known, the next step is to refer to the outdoor unit installation manual to make sure that you're getting the proper charge multiplier. That's the rate of refrigerant. The rate of refrigerant you'll be adding to the system, okay? which, which you will note is in pounds per foot. And just a reminder, weighing in, weigh in the additional refrigerant is the only method to charge that J-series system. So here, let's look at this. In this example, we have 98. Now multiply 98 by 0 0.039 pounds per foot, which will result in 3.82 pounds. 3.82 pounds, whatever. Right, so once you come up with that answer, it's to be as the first part of the calculation. Now you have 89 feet of quarter inch liquid pipe. We got to multiply that 89 by the factor of 0 0.014 pounds per foot, which results in 1.25 pounds, which is to be entered. Now, by adding those two subtotal values, we have determined a total charge. Now, the next step involves adding the additional refrigerant charge to the factory pre-charge to make sure we have the total system charge. Got to make sure that the, the, the service hours are open, right? Now, you want to when you're ready, back seat the valves. The outdoor unit panel. The outdoor unit panel has this information. You want to make sure that you're writing it in permanent marker. So, in the event that there's, you know, a refrigerant leak, um, the refrigerant must be recovered. Need to recover, right? And the total refrigerant charge will be added back into the system once the repair has been completed. You lost the charge. You got to recover whatever is in there. You got to recover. You can't pump it down because there's moisture in the system because there was a leak. So you got to pump that down and make sure. <clears throat> so let, let's, let's make sure we just do a little pre-startup, right? Prior to applying power to start a J-series installation, you may have wanted to complete the following, right? So you want to make sure of that. Now, a little recap. Where where are we on the installation as a, or a, a proper startup can commence? You should have completed the nitrogen pressure test, the entire system, 600 pounds, for a 24 hour period, a system evacuation, which, which uh, verifiably holds, you know, 500 microns or less for two hours using the digital micron uh, scale, digital scale, used and outdoor used. 
to include the terminal resistance settings and remote control in installation as, as it's made applicable for each of those environments. Now, before, before starting up, or turning out to that inverter, the line voltage, right, could be this. The line voltage, the line voltage, and disconnect the most be checked. Right, line voltage to disconnect must be checked to make sure it's within 230 volts. Right? We got to make sure the voltage is correct, right? As we discussed before applying power, we got to make sure we're 230, give or take 10 percent, right? And then we don't power the indoor units. We don't power the indoor units until the very end. So this compressor that we use, the compressor J2, J2S, J3L, the J3L has a scroll, factory installed crankcase heater, regardless of outdoor temperature. And this is in the book. I don't make this up. In the installation manual, it will tell you, regardless of the outdoor temperature, it is critical to make sure line voltage is applied for a minimum of 12 hours continuously before the outdoor unit is allowed to operate. This will make sure that there's no liquid refrigerant present in that crankcase when compressor is first energized, when it's before you power it up, right? Once the line voltage uh, has been applied to the indoor and outdoor units, the first check you'll want to make is to make sure uh, the status of the LED lights at the top left of the main control board at the outdoor unit. There should be no error code. It should be a solid green light. It should be a solid green light. We don't want to see an error code light. We don't want to see anything but a solid green light until you give a command. Right? On startup, three, three, uh, Three push buttons. Once the line voltage has been applied to the indoor and outdoor units, the first check you'll want to make is to verify that green light. Right? So let's get familiarized with these seven segment display the boards, the modes, the buttons, the mode, the exit, uh, uh, um, select and enter. Right? The mode exit button answers and exits a given function. The select button scrolls between values. The enter button used to select a value. So with the J series system, indoor unit connection must be performed prior to uh, function buttons are used to perform uh, the mandatory indoor unit connection check. Right, connection check must be performed at all J series systems in order to operate, no exceptions. The first step is to push the mode exit button, which will show you uh, F1 on the seven segment LED display. Push the, push the select button twice to scroll to F3, then push enter to display zero, zero, which is the first item code, right? Again, using select to scroll until you see the number 12. So it really should say. Right, so. Again, using select to scroll, push repeatedly until item code 12 is displayed, right? When item code 12 is displayed, push and hold enter until run is shown. Then you can release the enter button. The outdoor unit will begin to scan to identify, check to see how many units there are and communicate and communicating with, with indoor units, right? When the connection check is finished, the first display you will see is the letter U. Right, to indicate the number of discovered indoor units. Scroll to the next check by pushing the select button. You'll see the letter C for connected capacity, followed by the 
followed by the capacity as calculated. Now, once the indoor unit connection uh, check has completed successfully, push the enter button to display a pass status. Now, in the event you get an error code, in the event you get a uh, connection check fails, how to make sure all indoor units have power and controls are not calling for the heat, cool, or fan. If the error appears, press enter. Press enter, excuse me. Press enter to read the error. If more than one error is present, you need to press select to scroll to the next. When all the errors have been identified, use your manuals to address each issue. Most common error codes on startup are 22.1 capacity, 26.1 addressing error. So just some, some examples of startup on fail, which now, function setting F2.00 has to be set to make sure the proper operating pressures in both heat and cool modes. The length, one way of the discharge pipe measurement between the outdoor unit and the nearest indoor unit. You always want to make sure you, know, you want to make sure uh, that the heat pump systems provide a dedicated cooling or heating mode, right? Air stage heat pumps provide a dedicated cooling or heating mode, right? So in order to provide that auto changeover mode from the remote control, there are two different steps that you must complete. There's a, a, a master indoor unit, right? Primary indoor unit. The installer must select one indoor unit as your primary control, primary unit. Only that primary indoor unit may initiate a mode changeover. And all remaining indoor units in the same refrigerant system are locked into the same mode as the master or the primary indoor unit. Now, once a designated indoor un a unit is chosen, like the primary, and must be configured as, you know, through the remote controls, operating mode priority. There, there are three priority options provided by that outdoor unit. Number one, right? The first is where priority is given to the first command, which does not allow an auto changeover mode. Preferred will be the setting value zero two. Priority will be given to administrative indoor unit. And in order for the auto changeover function to be enabled from that remote control. Function 17, indoor unit height difference. Then you have heat mode only, right? Provide uh, adequate refrigerant flow into the lower coil. Outdoor unit function code 17 must be set to zero two. if any apply with two or more indoor units, right? So indoor unit is below the outdoor unit any distance and distance between indoor units is, is greater than nine feet. Uh, the base fan heater operating temperature said, you know, for those who live in cold, cold regions, those of you who live in really cold areas, you'll need to set the base pan heater operating temperature setting. The, the images displayed will show uh, charts with examples of the on-off operation of the different setting values, you know, based on the setting selected. So the on-off setting value of that base pan here during normal operation Right, like we talked about earlier, it can now be changed using function setting 19. It is recommended to leave this in a factory setting and only adjust the temperature if defrost does not complete successfully. 
function 40 for auto restart is one which you may want to change for every indoor unit. Default, the feature is disabled, which means if there is an interruption, power outage, whatever it may be, when the power is back on, it will return to an idle state, meaning that it doesn't know what you want it to do. When the auto restart is enabled, that unit will go back to the normally, you know, the normal operation that it was running before the power went out. 26 is a very popular function setting for static for static uh, uh, static settings, that static values, right? So function 26 applies to the ducted units only. The ducted units only, right? So it's it's to adjust uh, the air handler's total external static pressure setting, right? And just make sure that we know that the the factory default setting. We have to know this. The factory default setting for uh, those systems is is uh, um, thirty one, like you see here, right? That's the factory setting. Only and it only allows a, a maximum static of 0 0.10 inches of water column. Right. So in other words, anytime there's duct installed, this function setting must be changed to meet the pressure loss associated with ducting and any other device pressure loss in, in, uh, in let's just say, registers, grills, filters, especially filters, right? If you're doing anything with any type of MERV ratings, again, you have to do those calculations as well. Right, so if, if, if ducting is installed and the default setting is not changed, the, the airflow that, that you may think is going to come out and blow the doors off may not come out. Right? So that's something you need to talk about as well. So the, uh, the air stage units by default will provide continuous fan operation when the unit is in the cool mode, but not actively cooling, but it's idle. The fan's still spinning, but the compressor is not on. That indoor unit is not cooling, right? So that function setting 49 allows for intermittent or auto fan operation when the indoor unit is, um, Hold on one second, folks. So that, that function setting 49, it allows for intermittent auto fan operation when the indoor unit is not in the active cool call, right? It's not being called for cooling. You know, so that is that the fan will stop when the call for cooling has been satisfied. Additionally, in order to enable this function, the temperature sensing must be changed to the wired controller from the default, which is the return side of the unit. In the event uh, any support is needed, please contact your local distributor, right? People who sold you the equipment, they should have just as much knowledge as anyone else. Okay, but here's some other valuable uh, tools to assist you, like the Fujitsu Help Center at fujitsugeneral.zendesk.com and Fujitsu Online Learning Academy at connect.fujitsugeneral.com. Now we have a mobile technician app. It's in your mobile phone store. If you want to download it, download it. It's in your phone store. It's a great tool. It may take a little while to download because there's a ton of information in there. But once you download it and you've gone into your settings, you're now able to use that mobile technician app. And it's a wonderful tool. It's a great tool. It gets you to the, the steps that you need to get to. Right? 
So we've reached that that time where it is quiz time. In order to receive credit for attending this course, you must have an existing Fujitsu Connect account, connect.fujitsugeneral.com. If you receive a 70% score or above on the quiz at the end, right now, you'll receive the same number.